So for a while now, I've been really wanting to redo my tier list that I did of like all the DreamWorks and Disney and Pixar movies. And with DreamWorks releasing The Wild Robot, I thought now was as good a time as any. Because my opinions have changed a lot on some of these, we've had a lot of new movies come out, and after ranking this new DreamWorks ranking, yeah, things have changed a lot more than I thought they were going to. And we're changing up the format from a tier list into a full-on ranking video. And so without further ado, let's get into these DreamWorks movies. Starting with what I consider to be the worst of the DreamWorks movies, Shark Tale. This movie just has so many issues with it. I think the character designs are creepy. I do not like a lot of the jokes and the dialogue. It feels very low effort. It's just generally unappealing in so many ways. And over the years, I think it's just gotten worse. Now granted, every time I think of the song Car Wash, I always go back to this movie, unfortunately. But besides that, I almost never think about this movie and I'm happy to not watch this again. This was very much an experiment mental DreamWorks time where Shrek was a big hit so now they're trying to recreate Shrek and he didn't all land and this is one of them. Next up we have Ants which is DreamWorks first outing and yeah I gotta be real I'm not feeling this one. There are some cool ideas and some cool elements but overall I just felt the movie was just too dark and too not fun to watch. Like, I'm all up for dark concepts in movies, especially in ones that are family friendly. But here, it feels like they're being dark just because they want to be anti-Disney, as opposed to having a real purpose for it in your in your story or in your movie. And that's kind of where you lose me. Oh, the character designs are off-putting also, but I, I equate that more to the timing. This was like, what, the second full-length CG animated film ever made? Or the third one? I don't know, depending on how you look at that feud with Bugs Life. But yeah, I just, I never got into this one. I appreciate what it did for films later on, but yeah, for me, their first step was a pretty big misstep. Next we have Turbo, the movie about the fast snail that I don't think anybody remembers. And I have to remind myself that this movie exists. Even though the film ended up being better than I initially thought it was gonna be upon watching the trailer, it was underwhelming in pretty much every single aspect of the storytelling. I thought the characters were just eh, the story plot was totally predictable, they didn't do anything new or exciting with it. It just kind of feels like this is one of those movies that kind of got the table scraps of every other DreamWorks movie, and they said let's try to churn out a movie with this. Next up, we have The Boss Baby. I know, cue all the Boss Baby jokes. This is the Oscar nominated <laughs> Boss Baby. <laughs> but yeah, this film in and of itself isn't bad. It's just run of the mill, mediocre, just nothing special to it in my opinion. And I don't know, maybe it's just because I have watched a bunch of this with my nieces. It's not quite as bad as I remember being, but yeah, it's still not great. I still think that they had a lot of cool elements with like making this all be in Tim's imagination. The first movie really tried to make it look like it was Tim's imagination because that's actually a really interesting premise. But then through every show, every sequel, anything else re related to Boss Baby, they're really like, no, this is real. It's like, why did you work so hard to make that happen in the first movie to then just try to retcon that for every other thing that exists? I don't know. It is what it is. There's Boss Baby. Next up, the Boss Baby family business. It has all the same problems as the first one, but you gave me Jeff Goldblum as a baby. For some reason, that made me laugh. Moving on. Next we have Spirit Untamed. I have not watched this movie since I did the first tier list. So my thoughts on it haven't really changed. I was expecting this to be just an awful, terrible movie and I was mad at the premise that they gave Spirit like a, a person when he's supposed to be wild and free. The idea of it makes me mad, but the movie itself was fine. So I can't really be that mad at it. Like they did it fine. They showed that, you know, he wasn't going to be like easily tamed and they actually show like how he would have a relationship with her. So like, okay, you know what? It's okay. It's not great, which is why it's still pretty low on the list, but I can't put it at the very bottom. But this is harmless. 
Next we have the B movie. Now I know a lot of people love this movie ironically, I am not one of them. Like I acknowledge that there's some ridiculous stuff in this movie that's kind of fun. And it's always fun to hear no another Patrick Warburton character, but yeah, to say that this made a really lasting impact on me in a positive way, no, it really didn't. It feels very unfocused, like it pulls up a plot just to forget it two minutes later. But some of the jokes were funny, and some of the concepts were just so bizarre I kinda had to love them. Next up we have Monsters vs. Aliens, another one that kinda just falls into like the this is still DreamWorks after they made Shrek and they're trying to make Shrek again and they just can't do it. It had some good ideas, it had some good moments, but just overall it kinda felt unbalanced. The characters, although they were fun, didn't quite hit home the way I wish that they did. And I like Rain Wilson's performance as the alien, but yeah, no, it just, as a whole, it didn't quite gel for me. But I don't know. Maybe I was expecting too much with this, but for what we got, it was all right. Now, next we have Shrek the Third. I actually had this lower on my list when I first got started, but then realized even a bad Shrek movie is, you know, kind of fun. Like, there were some moments that I will always treasure from this movie. Like, I love seeing the princesses, like, storm the castle. I actually thought Merlin was funny. But yeah, overall, the comedy in this movie just didn't quite hit like the first two did. There was just a lot of weird storytelling here. I was not a fan of Arthur. Good not alive. Prince Charming just should not have been the villain. He is not fun without his mother around, which is a sentence taken out of context I never thought I'd say. And yeah, the story beats with Shrek were predictable. I felt like they didn't do much with it, even though you had every opportunity to dealing with like, you know, Shrek dealing with, my dad tried to eat me. You could have gone further into that, but it was like a one line throwaway gag when that could have been in a, a really unique emotional moment. Easily the worst Shrek movie but not completely devoid of charm. Next, we have Home, a cute little movie about, you know, an alien and a girl who go on an adventure and the alien learns to overcome his fears and his fears that have been like dominated by his entire species. It's an interesting way of looking at overcoming fear. I just kind of wish the movie did more with it. <laughs> It was fine. Like, it's a fun family adventure. There's very little I'd say that is bad about it, but there's also not a lot good that I can say about it either. It feels like everything was just good enough for me to check the, it's fine, box. It's one of the most, like, fine movies from DreamWorks. Just, eh, it's alright. Just the whole movie was just kind of this homogenous, just, eh to me. Not bad enough for me to get mad over, but not good enough for me to really defend. It's just kind of there. Next we got Mr. Peabody and Sherman, which is a weird movie that I don't go to often, and I recently just watched some clips going like, yeah, this was weird. I mean, even as somebody who grew up with the original Rocky and Bullwinkle and knew Mr. Peabody and Sherman, it's still kind of a weird premise. So kind of like Home, I didn't feel like they did necessarily anything bad in this, but they also didn't necessarily do anything really good. But the main reason that it is above Home is because I liked a few of the characters that we found in like history. I liked uh, the Patrick Warburton character, I forget who it was, was it Odysseus? Agamemnon. Okay, Ag Agamemnon. I enjoyed a lot of the voice performances I heard in this, but overall, yeah, the story plot and how it went was kind of bland. But for what it is, it's a fine, harmless, kind of homogenous movie. Next, we have Trolls Band Together. I know a lot of people were loving on this film when it came out. They really enjoyed the villains in this. I will admit, the villains were by far the best part, so I'm with you there. But the movie as a whole, yeah, just it felt like your typical trolls. Much like Homer, <laughs> Mr. Peabody, and Sherman, it's in that homogenous storytelling range where it's not bad, but it's not good enough for me to get excited over either. And I felt this one lacked some of the personality that the first movie and the second movie had. I don't know, it still just didn't quite gel for me as much as I would have liked to, but there was also nothing egregiously awful with it either. So, uh, yeah, there it is. Next up, we have Trolls! And yeah, like the third one, this kind of has that it's not good enough to be great, but not bad enough to be awful. It's just kind of in that eh zone. But I did appreciate the original song that they made for this movie. Can't stop the feeling. That was actually a lot of fun. I like what they did with Bridget's character. Overall, I thought it had a fun and quirky atmosphere. 
so it gets a point up for that. And next up, Trolls World Tour! Yeah, I basically think about all the Trolls movies the same. Yeah, Trolls 2 is in that still homogenous region, but to me it's the best of the Trolls movies, because did it take a big departure from the first movie? Yeah, but as you see, I'm not the biggest fan of the first one, so I don't care. But I like the idea of having a different troll for like every type of music. And I love the fact that two of my favorite genres got uh, shown, the classical trolls and the country trolls. I know, weird combination. I'm always down to listen to some George Strait or Mozart, depending on the day. <laughs> I do kind of wish that classical music got more representation than like one flashback and then one guy going, beautiful, give us a little bit more classical music. <laughs> they did more than the first movie did in my opinion and I liked it more so I was cool with it. Next we have Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken. Yeah, this movie was fine. I think it did a few things better than Trolls and Home and Mr. Peabody and Sherman, but not a lot for me to put it much higher than this. I think this would have resonated more if the twist wasn't so blatantly obvious and they didn't tell us the twist in the trailers, because yeah, that really ruined it. If they had made a few more stakes in the game, like created more of an emotional attachment between the Kraken and the mermaid, if they had made that like a genuine friendship and then these things started happening, I think we would have gotten a much more satisfying movie. Yeah, everything just kind of felt low stakes. And if you have low stakes, at least up the comedy. And I didn't think the comedy was particularly strong. Kind of like the films before, it didn't do anything bad but it didn't do anything great, but the stuff they did was slightly better than the movie that's below it in the ranking. <laughs> Next up, we have Over the Hedge. We're starting to get back in from the mid territory into good stuff now. Although I didn't think as good as some of the other films around its time, Over the Hedge was certainly an improvement on most of the other post Shrek movies. To me, there was just a spark that was missing here. Like the characters all seemed fun in a vacuum, but I felt didn't quite mesh together as well as I would like. It feels like anytime we have to focus on a new character, they don't gel with the rest of the group well. It's like, oh, we have to stop and have the possum moment. Oh, we gotta stop and have the squirrel moment. Oh, we gotta stop and have the skunk moment. You can have those integrated with like the main story beats, but I don't feel like that really happened very well. And so the movie felt very disjointed because of it. But when the jokes hit here, they hit pretty well. Like, I still remember losing my mind when Hammy drank the energy drink. For everyone who's like, oh, this is an X-Men ripoff, this came out first. It's certainly not a bad movie, but I kind of wish it had a little more time in the oven to really solidify some of these characters, make them work better as a cohesive whole, and maybe do a little R&R &R on the villains in RJ. But it's not a bad movie. Next, we have Penguins of Madagascar. I thought this film was fun. There wasn't a lot there as far as substance goes, but I don't think you're going to a movie with the title of Penguins of Madagascar if you're really looking for a thought-driven, provoking story. You're looking to just go see the penguins on a crazy mission and just see shenanigans happen. And there were shenanigans aplenty. And I also really love the story that Dave the Octopus, he was the main villain to see his background. I thought that was kind of an interesting backstory. And him using all the celebrity names as the names of his like <laughs> minions. It was stupid, but I love that stupid humor. It was hilarious. And to this day, I think about those frequently. Elijah, would you lock them up, please? Stuff like that. <laughs> I kind of wish they could do the movie without the North Wind, because not that the North Wind are bad. I kind of wish the story was just the penguins utterly failing until they accidentally succeed. I just feel like that would have been funnier. But, you know, for what it was, I think it was a lot of fun. Next, we have Abominable. Not the greatest movie DreamWorks ever made, but still a solid fun time. This definitely feels a little safer than some of their other works, but there was enough comedy and enough heart to really keep me coming back to this one. Now let me be clear, the comedy in Penguins of Madagascar was better, but I thought the heart was done better here. And for me, heart usually beats out comedy. Not always, as you will see, but I felt they did a lot to distance themselves from other movies, like a kid finding some mythical creature and having to hide it from the government. Like that story's been done to death since E.T. But I 
thought they did enough to, like, really separate themselves, and I liked this eccentric, like, animal collector. He was crazy, but that was part of the charm of it. He was ridiculous, which thus made him fun. So it was nothing spectacular, but it's worth your time if you ever want to check it out. Next up, we have Puss in Boots, the first spin-off movie for this cat, was fine. Not a lot more than that, but had some good jokes, had some really cool moments, but as a whole, kind of was the weaker link in the Shrek universe chain. You know, except for Shrek the Third, that was definitely weaker. I really liked the voice acting in this one. I thought Zach Galifianakis did a great job as Humpty Dumpty. Of course, Antonio Banderas' Puss in Boots is just perfect casting. Summer Hike as Kitty Softpaws, also a really great choice. If you're just looking for a fun adventure just to mindlessly watch and have a couple good jokes, eh, this is not a bad option to go with. Next, we have The Croods, A New Age. I am a weirdly big fan of the first Croods, and although this isn't bad by any means, I felt that this installment kind of lost a lot of what I personally loved about the first Croods. I have a hard time putting into words exactly what it lost. I guess what I really loved was seeing the Croods in like a brand new wild and crazy environment that they'd have no idea what to expect, and this one technically went to a new area that they didn't know what to expect, but everything was far safer. Like, they, they had to experience civilization for the first time. And for me, I find that less exciting and less fun to watch. But I can't say what they did with it was bad either. I still enjoyed it. The big fight at the family table, I laugh so hard at, especially when Gran got involved. And, and especially when Gran's wig got involved. <laughs> But I liked the heart that it had. I liked the new characters that we got. This was definitely a lot of fun. Still love the first one a lot more, but this was not bad. Next, we have Captain Underpants. I did not grow up with Captain Underpants. Like, I knew of the books. I had friends who read the books, and they showed me a few things as I was growing up, but I never read them. But this movie was just unabashedly just ridiculous, and you kind of got to love it for that. It's like you reach inside the mind of a 10 year old and just say like, here's what they're thinking. And it just turns into this movie. It reminds me of that weird spot in your childhood brain where just everything makes sense and nothing makes sense. And don't get me wrong, the, the humor is 100% juvenile and stupid, but it's done so in a way where it's weirdly smart. Like it knows when to do it and it knows when not to. You know, it, it weirdly had me laughing. Like at one point, everything that turned into sock puppets. And I just thought that was so weirdly funny and creative. There's something about my inner child that will never hate this movie. That it was just unabashedly fun, ridiculous, and stupid. And I mean stupid in a good way. Next up is Rise of the Guardians. Another film that I think some people would have wanted me to rank higher. And I don't dislike Rise of the Guardians by any means. Heck, it, it made it this far in the list. So I obviously don't hate it. I think it's a really good movie. I don't think it's as good as some people say that it is. I think people are more in love with the concept of this movie and this world and what it could be versus the movie itself. At least that's my thought. Because the premise is amazing. The premise is really cool. And I would love to see more done with this premise. But the movie as a whole, for what it is, it's a good movie. But I don't think lives up to what I would personally want from this, so that's why it didn't get too high on the list. But for what it gave me, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Next up, I kind of feel bad for putting this one so low, but I put Chicken Run. I feel bad putting any of the Aardman films this low, but it's not because they're not good, but it's just because Dreamers has done some other stuff that I just think is so much better. But I love Aardman. I also debated about putting in the sequel into this, even though DreamWorks didn't make Chicken Run 2. Just to be clear, I'm not gonna put it on the list, but if I did, it would literally just be one rank below Chicken Run. But anyways, back to Chicken Run. I did enjoy this movie. I thought it was really well done. I love the stop motion of it. Of course, it's Aardman. Aardman's work is fantastic. Of course, the animation is fantastic. I thought a lot of the heists were very ingenuitive. I love the big climactic ending. I thought Mrs. Tweety was like one of those great villains that are just so much fun to hate. It's not my favorite of the Aardman Aardman films that DreamWorks has released, but still a great time. And next up, sticking with Aardman, we have Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. 
I thoroughly enjoyed this movie, thought it was a whole lot of fun. Although the mystery was pretty easy to sort out near the beginning of the movie, it was still a fun journey getting there. And also, I just enjoyed all the voice acting here. Of course, I love Gromit. Gromit might be my favorite part of any of these Wallace and Gromit movies or shorts. Just a really great, solid movie. There was nothing in it that I thought was necessarily bad. Just everything above this, I just thought there were elements that movies did better in certain regards. So, there's Wallace and Gromit. So, I guess for me, Ardman movies are all in about the same category because next up we have Flushed Away. Definitely my favorite of the Ardman movies. But Flushed Away, I just thought had a little was a little bit more fun in my opinion. And I love Whitey. Whitey is hilarious and Bill Nighy plays him so well. Spike and Whitey are just hilarious. I love the villain of the toad. And then there's the frog. <laughs> I thought Hugh Jackman got a good, did a good job of playing Roddy and it still got that Ardman seal of quality which is just fantastic and yeah and I think when it came out I also just thought the screaming slugs were hilarious. Now I can see how they might be a little annoying but child me will always see them as a lot of fun. Next up we have Road to El Dorado. I know a lot of people would put this movie a lot higher but like, like you heard, we're already in these movies are great territory. So this is not a snide to El Dorado being this low. It's just more to say the movies above, I just thought were even better. Such a fun adventure. The 2D animation in this is just so beautiful. It's just, it's just a wild ride. And it's got some fun songs by Elton John and Tim Rice. You know, the same duo who did The Lion King get can't be mad at that. I would have liked a little bit more of emotional, you know, drama and things. It seemed very light on that, but it was also supposed to be like a light adventure comedy, so I can't really get too mad at it for that, especially when it did the adventure part pretty well. Next up, we have Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas. Now that might be controversial, I'll put this above El Dorado, but Personally, I enjoyed Sinbad a little bit more. It was a fun adventure. Yeah, maybe the CG elements mixed with 2D don't hold up quite as well as I wish that they would, but I don't know, I've said it before. This has a million things in this I should hate, but for some reason, I don't hate them here. It's so much fun. It's a great adventure. I can't be mad at it. Just Sinbad, Sinbad's a good time. Next up, we have Madagascar. I debated about whether or not Madagascar should go above El Dorado and Sinbad because in some ways I do like those a lot better, but it really boiled down to King Julian, weirdly enough. I love King Julian. He's one of my favorite characters to do impressions for. Like he's just so much fun to slip into the voice, Margo. <laughs> Not to say that I dislike the Madagascar films, I think they're fun, but I probably think the storytelling of El Dorado and Sinbad were better, but I had more fun with Madagascar, especially King Julian. Most people are in love with the penguins from the Madagascar series, me, I'm with the lemurs, which is why I was extra happy when King Julian got his own show on Netflix. And yes, I saw it, and it was as unhinged as I wanted it to be, so I'm happy. Next up, sticking to the Madagascar theme, we're Madagascar 2 Escape to Africa. I did think the story was a little bit better in this one. I thought the characters had a lot more room to like be a little zanier and crazier. While it didn't make as much sense as the first movie, I think that was to its benefit in my opinion. The crazier these movies get, the better they get in my opinion. Not by an egregious amount because it's only one rank above, but there you go. And it's got King Julian, I can't be mad. Next up, surprising absolutely no one, Madagascar 3, Europe's Most Wanted. Once again, I think it did slightly better than the movie before. This got a little more unhinged and crazy, especially with the cop that tracks them down. She made this movie. But then King Julian also falls in love with a bear. That's just unhinged and crazy enough for me to love it. Madagascar I love because it's random and it's crazy and ridiculous and I, I just can't hate it. I really can't. And next up, it's been a while since we've had a Shrek movie, so here we go, Shrek Forever After. To me, I think this was a great send off for the series. Ignore the fact we're getting Shrek 5, but this was dramatically better than Shrek the third. You got to see Shrek and Fiona fall in love all over again. You get to see that emotional core that we love so much. You get to see Donkey in a new way, Puss in Boots in a new way. They did a lot with this to really say, hey, we heard you on Shrek the third and we're gonna give Shrek one last hurrah before we ride into the sunset and then make Puss in Boots our main star. <laughs> 
and then later get bought by Universal and then they're like, let's make Shrek 5. Kudos for Shrek Forever After. Now next up, we have one of the more recent DreamWorks films with Kung Fu Panda 4. Now I know some people like super hate Kung Fu Panda 4 and they're like, it's dramatically worse than the first three. And it is worse than the first three, I'm not gonna argue that. But I am of the opinion that it's still a good movie. I think in some ways it treated the franchise very, very well. And in other ways, it kind of undercut some of what Kung Fu Panda did. I still think it is a competently made movie with a competent theme and arc that are all well done enough to be considered good, but not so much to be one of the great upper echelons of DreamWorks. But yeah, Kung Fu Panda 4, definitely the worst of the Panda Bunch, but still not bad in my opinion. Next up, we have The Bad Guys. Yes, this movie came in and people went absolutely nuts for this movie. And as you can see, I definitely enjoyed it. It cracked into the top 15 movies of DreamWorks, which I know that doesn't sound great on paper, when, but when you have 47 other ones to work with, yeah, it went up pretty high. Everyone said it to death, but this animation is absolutely spectacular. The characters were really fun and engaging, and yeah, the story was a bit simplistic, it kind of didn't need a whole lot more than that. It just needed to be a great heist adventure, and I think this movie gave it to us pretty well. The dilemma that Wolf and Snake go through feels very believable for the two, and seeing them kind of change and morph over time was really engaging, and seeing how their relationship was tested because of it. And also, I just really love the song that Piranha sang. I know you're thinking of me, you reach your own conclusions. Now we come to Megamind, one of my favorites of the superhero genre. Something really resonated with me in Megamind. Making fun of the superhero tropes while also being a good superhero movie in and of itself. It subverts a lot of your expectations in some of the best ways. It kept me guessing. I thought Will Ferrell's performance was fantastic to this day. I think it's still my favorite performance he's ever given, live action or animated. I just, I love him in this role. I love the idea of like, a Superman-esque character who just decides he's kind of done and wants to step away. This was such a creative idea in a time when we did have a lot of anti-heroes going around. But to me, Mega Mind was always a little different. It always stuck out a little bit. Next up, we have the first Croods. Like I said, I am a weirdly big fan of the first Croods. When I first saw it, I just thought it was clever and fun and fresh. I know a lot of people just said it's a Flintstones meets The Simpsons knockoff, but I don't know. I saw it as so much more than that. I thought the world in and of itself was really fun and engaging. Once again, we're getting into nature and animals, so of course that's going to be one of my favorite elements. But I also love this idea of having to push through the things you're afraid of. That's a very big thing for me. I tend to be a very scared and timid person and I have had to learn how to fight through that and be able to move forward with my life and so I resonate a lot with that and just I thought this comedy was hysterical. I remember watching this just laughing my butt off at everything. Just everything just hit me in the funny bone in just the right way. Woo! And here we go, we're getting into the cream of the crop! I'm so excited! These were all movies that I really struggled to figure out where they'd go on this list, but dad gum, oh, I'm happy to talk about all these. First up, we have Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron. Woo! Y'all! 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 Now, I know for most people, you either love this movie or you hate this movie, and I am in the camp that loves this movie. I love Hans Zimmer's music, the songs that Brian Adams sing. I know some people see them as kind of cheesy and like, oh, that's just so on the nose, but I don't care. I love them. The animation is gorgeous. James Baxter outdid himself with these horses. The fact that the horses don't talk. I mean, yeah, you got like that Matt Damon like voiceover stuff, but honestly, I could take or leave that. I have a connection to the Old West and stuff. You know, I did grow up in Texas, so a lot of that iconography is a big deal to me. Animals, nature, music, animation, you put it all together, that's gonna be a recipe that I'm gonna love. Next up, we have How to Train Your Dragon and the Hidden World. We're starting off with the last of the How to Train Your Dragon bunch. 
mainly because, uh, to me, this was the weakest of all three. I think the way the story ended was fantastic, and I think the story between Hiccup and Toothless was fantastic. I often watch the ending of this over and over because I love where it ended. They did a really good job of, like, wrapping up this story. I mean, but the side characters really killed it for me in this one. I'm sorry. Like, every time they showed up, I, like, viscerally was like, no, go away. I don't want you here. Even though I really loved all these side characters in the TV show, I did not like them here. I wanted them gone, and I thought they got way too much screen time. Especially when one of the main plot points involves... Was it Rough Nut? That's the girl one, right? I know there's Rough Nut and Tough Nut, but I forget who's who. Like, if they weren't there, or at least had dramatically less screen time, this movie probably would have gone higher. And just, uh, everything with Hiccup, Toothless, Astrid, just... Yes. A million times over. And with that, we've reached the top 10. And number 10 is Shrek. The one that most people say really got DreamWorks going. Shrek might be like the perfect modern fairy tale. A one that is irreverent, really likes to push the envelope past what you expect. It was one of the most subversive fairy tales while still being a good fairy tale in and of itself. And as we've seen by the dozens and dozens of Shrek clones over the years, that is not an easy balance to make. Heck, Shrek couldn't even keep that up as we've talked about with Shrek 3 already. But they did something really special here. The relationship between Fiona and Shrek is weirdly believable and yet weirdly strange at the same time. Shrek and Donkey feel like they should be a duo that just doesn't work, but yet they work splendidly. Even Donkey falling in love with a dragon. All of this stuff feels weird, but in the course of the movie, it feels natural and it feels like it was always supposed to be that way. It's a weird balance that they made, and I mean weird in the best possible way. Next up, we have Kung Fu Panda 3. When I first saw Kung Fu Panda 3, I gotta be honest, I wasn't really super into it. I thought it was good, but not as good as the first two. But then I kept watching it, and over time, this thing just kept getting better and better and better to where I really thought this was a solid, fantastic movie and really stuck the landing with its message. The comedy didn't quite hit as hard as the other ones did, and it did feel a little goofier as opposed to more serious like the first two did, but I still think they did a tremendous job, and I personally have gotten a lot out of it over the years. So, Kung Fu Panda 3, you're at number nine. Number eight, the first Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> the first Kung Fu Panda was such a surprise. I remember seeing these trailers going, oh wow, DreamWorks has no ideas left. This is bad. But then once I saw this movie, I was like, wow, do they have a hit on their hands. Kung Fu Panda has a special place in my heart more than almost any other franchise that DreamWorks has. That I just really resonate with Poe, his journey. Although I will acknowledge, I think that some of the other movies are better. Kung Fu Panda as an IP is probably my favorite thing that DreamWorks has made. The storytelling is fantastic. The characters are fantastic. It's just been a constant comfort that I just love having Poe and the gang around. There's something very comforting about them. Number seven, How to Train Your Dragon. This is a phenomenal movie. An absolutely spectacular movie. I remember seeing this in theaters for the first time going, this is why I come to movie theaters. This is why I, 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 love, the, I love film, is seeing stuff like this. Technically, yes, How to Train Your Dragon is a relatively easy story to figure out where it's going to go, but the way it's done, it feels like you're hearing the story for the very first time. The voice acting is spectacular. The music, oh, the music, you guys. It's one of those times in a theater that I remember my heart just like leaping out of me and just like soaring with Hiccup and Toothless so many times. It's just so special. Next up, we have Kung Fu Panda 2. To me, this is the absolute best of the Kung Fu Panda series. Shin is a weirdly amazing villain. You'd think that a peacock wouldn't be intimidating, but I think he's the most intimidating villain that Kung Fu Panda has ever seen. The music in this was insane. The storytelling was some of the best we've ever seen from DreamWorks. The emotional moments rang so true. Seeing Poe deal with the fact that he was adopted and dealing with those complicated emotions oh, was just spectacular. It's Kung Fu Panda 2, what else can I say? It's amazing. And now with that, we've reached the top five. And the number five pick, How to Train Your Dragon 2. 
I didn't think I would be enjoying another How to Train Your Dragon film as much as I did the first one. But the second one came in and just gave me even more. Just the power that this movie had. Like when I first watched it in theaters, there was this huge power that I felt throughout the whole thing from beginning to end. It just felt like the stakes were huge and that there was so much going on. Oh, everything was so important and everything was big and grand and every every emotion felt bigger. Every laugh felt bigger. Just everything felt bigger from the first one. And in my in my opinion, in a much better way than the first one. Not that to say the first movie was bad. I said it was phenomenal. But there was something about that second one that just hit harder, you know? Next up, I'm surprised it got put this low, even though it's still at number four, The Prince of Egypt. If you've seen Prince of Egypt, I don't need to explain why it's this high up. This is one of those animation masterpieces that you just gotta see. That you just gotta see. I have heard this story so many times, and I've heard it told so poorly from so many like church-made movies and stuff to where the story kind of lost a lot of its feeling for me. But then when I saw this, it brought it all back. So I'm like, oh, this made this feel real. Like I finally understand a bit more about how this would have actually looked, you know? It's just, oh, the storytelling, the characters, every aspect of the story is just a masterpiece. I don't have a better word to describe it. This is just a pure D masterpiece of animation and DreamWorks should just be immensely proud that they were a part of this. And number three on my list, this movie made quite the jump from the last tier list, Shrek 2. This might be the perfect comedy to me. The jokes hit so consistently, one after another, just joke after joke of just, I, I don't think there's a single joke that falls flat. It propels the story, adding to the world of Shrek, getting you more engaged with the characters than you already were, getting these amazing jokes after jokes, and they have a good heart to where even though it's not the main focus, but it's still emotionally resonant. You've got Puss in Boots showing up for the first time and he was a laugh riot. Donkey was funnier than the first movie. Shrek was funnier than he was the first time. Putting them in this scenario was hilarious. The P Fiona's parents were hilarious. Everything just worked. And the fairy godmother, oh, the fairy godmother. This film is the perfect comedy. Shrek 2, incredible. But we're not leaving the Shrek universe just yet. Number two, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Who would have thought that the first Puss in Boots movie would have released to tepid acclaim to then having one of the greatest animated films of all time being its sequel? Just how do you get there? Puss in Boots, The Last Wish is incredible. It's almost as good a comedy as Shrek 2, but with four times like the emotional turmoil seeing Puss in Boots deal with his own mortality to the point where they show one of the best anxiety attacks ever created on screen. It was just, oh. I mean, what can I say about Puss in Boots The Last Wish that has not already been said? That this film should not have happened. This shouldn't have been this good. But yet here we are with one of the greatest animated films of all time being about the joking cat from Shrek 2. But here we are, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, just fired on all cylinders, you guys. And now here we go to number one, The Wild Robot. I know, I know, the movie just came out. I've only seen it once at this point of making the video. And it, could this be recency bias that I'm putting it up this high? Of course. And I even was scared to put it up this high for that reason. But then again, when Puss in Boots The Last Wish came out, I thought the same thing then, going like, this might be the best DreamWorks movie ever. And then I'm like, oh, that's just because I just watched it. But then I gave it like another year and a half and it was still sitting there. So I'm going to go with my gut and say that the wild robot will probably stay there. To me, this movie just felt like perfection like it was the perfect way to tell this story with just everything clicking in the best ways i have not been that emotionally just invested in a movie in so 
long, you guys. I can't tell you just how enthralled I was with this movie, with this world, with the themes, with the music, with the animation, just everything, everything, just, ah! Oh! I can't get over how much I love The Wild Robot. I can't wait for it to come out on digital because I want to watch it like eight more times and I want to go to the theater again and see it. It was just so good, you guys. I just walked out of the theater going, I don't think Masterpiece is a strong enough word. Just, I just feel like it did everything perfectly. So there you go, my number one movie, Wild Robot. So will these opinions change in the future? Almost assuredly, but for right now, this is where I stand. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know in the comments, was there any that were like super <laughs> far away from what you were thinking? And uh, I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. And big thank you to all of my Patreons. Without you, this channel wouldn't be what it is today. Thank you so much.